Um, <laughs> this, this chapter, yeah, I could easily make this two sermons. I'm going to try to keep it as one. If I feel like the time's getting away with me, uh, from me, then I might take certain parts of it and preach the rest of it on Thursday. But I'm going to try my best to uh, just cover it in this one sermon. So please look at verse 21, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. It says, For since by man came death, by man came also, what? The resurrection of the dead. The title of the sermon this morning is The Resurrection of the Dead. Let's get straight into it. Verse number one. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, what? The gospel. We talk about the gospel. We talk about preaching the gospel. Do you know what the gospel is? You know, is it live your best life now? (laughs) What's the gospel? You know? He says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. And again, we re- it's reinforcing the fact that Paul was the person that got this church, or many of the people in this church, saved. He's the one that preached the gospel to them. They got saved and they're in this church. And then we know, obviously, that Peter came through, Apollos came through, other men of God came through, won many more souls to the Lord, and they were added to this church. But then it says, he, which, ye, which also ye have received... And wherein ye stand. So it's the gospel is something we need to receive, right? It's a free gift, and your choice is to either reject it or to receive it. How do we receive it? Through faith, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And wherein ye stand. We stand on the gospel, okay? The whole, the whole um, foundation of your faith, of your Christianity, is what Christ has done for us, okay? Is the good news. And verse number two, by which also ye are saved... If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, some people have taken this verse to say, well, see, if you stop believing the gospel, you've believed in vain and you're you're, you're, you're lost. You're, You're not saved anymore. That's not what it's saying, okay? We know that when you receive eternal life, it's eternal. We know that it's everlasting. We know it's something that once we receive, it can never be lost. Otherwise, it was never everlasting. Otherwise, it was never eternal. Okay, so how do we understand what's being said here? Well, basically, it's vain to forget the gospel message. Okay, now you might think, well, Kevin, hold on. How is it possible to forget the gospel message? I'll tell you now, there are Christians throughout the the world and even in the independent fundamental Baptists that have forgotten the gospel. They probably heard the gospel as a child. They understood it as a child. They believed like a child. They put all their faith and trust on Jesus Christ as a child. And then they grow up, they become prideful with their performance, and all of a sudden, instead of thinking I'm saved because of Jesus Christ, well, I'm saved because of my performance. Look at me. Look at me. Look how good I am. This is a surety that I am saved. It is a surety that I've met the standard, whatever standard God has, right, of this new creature, which is, by the way, perfection. No one meets that standard, okay? You will never meet that standard in this life. But all of a sudden, they're looking at your life. That, you know, people are looking at your life, looking at your performance, or looking at how much you can keep the law of God as their evidence of your salvation. That's someone that's forgotten the gospel. They've forgotten that our eyes are set on Christ, on his, we'll see soon, his death, burial, and resurrection. So it is possible to forget the gospel, then what you've believed is in vain, meaning that it's empty, it's useless, meaning that you can't then use that gospel and get other people saved. Because you're not teaching the gospel anymore. You're, te- you're, te- you're teaching some sort of lordship, change your life, salvation, putting the focus back on man rather than the focus on God. Look at verse number three. For I delivered unto you first. What was the first thing he delivered unto them? The gospel, right? That which I also received, the same gospel he received. You see that? I'm preaching to you the gospel. I preach to you the gospel that was preached unto me. And that's why you can forget the gospel. Yes, the right gospel can be preached to you. You mess it up. You make it extra complicated. And now you're no longer preaching the gospel that was delivered unto you. You know, he's reinforcing, hey, uh, this is not some new thing. This is what I heard. This is what was passed down. And this is what's been passed down for 2,000 years. And we're still preaching the same gospel. What is it? What is it? It says here, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the gospel, is the good news that we go out and teach this area, this community. And that's the job of every Christian. Okay? We've received it. Should we keep it to ourselves? No. We pass it on. Okay? We don't want to forget the gospel. And look, the more you preach the gospel, the more you're going to keep it in your remembrance. The less likely you are to fall 
for you know, people that deceive you on the gospel. Okay? But I just want to show you that the scriptures emphasize the physical death, the physical burial, and the physical resurrection. Okay? Throughout the scriptures, that is what is being emphasized. This is the gospel according to Paul. Okay? Now, does that mean there's no spiritual you know, connotation to what happened? No, of course. There's some spiritual things that developed during the death, burial, and resurrection. But when we preach the gospel, we need to be clear and make sure that people understand it's the physical death, burial, and resurrection. That is what's emphasized throughout the scriptures. Okay? And we'll see soon why it's so important that it's a physical resurrection. Because you have your cults out there, like the Jehovah Witnesses, that teach, no, Jesus was not resurrected physically, but spiritually. Okay? But we'll see soon, I mean, this whole chapter is about a physical resurrection. Okay? Now look at verse number 5. We, we've, and a lot of these, these verses we've already covered in other sermons because it's, it's filled with so much truth, so much great things. But now it says, and that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve, verse number five. So if you remember, we went, I, I preached a sermon called, I think it was called They Saw the Lord. Okay, it was about the chronology of Christ's resurrection and how he appeared to his disciples one by one. And we tried to develop a chronology by looking at all the passages. Well, this is a quick breakdown of some of the people. It's, it is in chronological order, but it doesn't cover everybody that Christ appeared to. But first, we're met here we're, it's mentioned Cephas. Cephas being Simon Peter, then of the twelve. So the appearance of Peter is not recorded anywhere in the Bible, but it is supported in Luke chapter 24, because it is mentioned there that Jesus appeared to Peter, if you guys remember my sermon back then. Then of the twelve. So the, the, like even, even without Judas Iscariot, because Judas had already uh, committed suicide, the group of the apostles, that, that 12, was still called the 12, even though there was only 11 there. In fact, there was 10, because Thomas wasn't there either, if you remember the story. Okay? But still, sometimes in the Bible, you hear about the 12. It's just referring to those 12 apostles. Whether they're all there or not, that's just a title that's given to that group of apostles. Verse number 6. After that, he was seen above... 500, not 5,000, 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. So you remember where that was? That was in a mountain in Galilee. You know, Jesus had instructed, hey, get all the disciples, everyone that believes me, to come to Galilee, and there I will, I will show myself to them. There were over 500 there on that day. And then it says, Paul says, look, some of them have passed on. So they would have been older believers, I assume. Older believers that have passed on through life. But then many were still alive today as well. Verse number, uh, verse number seven. Um, after that, he was seen of James. And again, the, the appearance to James is not recorded anywhere else. This is the only place in the Bible that you get to hear about Jesus appearing to James. Then of all the apostles, because that final appearing that he's mentioning there is the Mount of Olives when he ascended up into heaven in a cloud, okay? Then, of all the apostles, that's the Mount of Olives, when he goes up, ascends into heaven, in the clouds. I'll just quickly read to you Acts chapter 1, verse 9, 10, 11. You don't need to turn there. It says this, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him. So when Jesus went up into heaven, what received him on his way up? A cloud, okay? A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So there's a promise that Christ will return. How will he return? In like manner. So when he returns, he was, you know, when, when he went to heaven, he was received into that cloud, but when he returns, he's going to come with the clouds. Right? When we read about the, re the return of Christ, the coming of Christ, the clouds are constantly mentioned. Right? Christ coming in the clouds. Look at verse number 8. Verse number 8, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So Paul's missed all that great event, but on his road to Damascus, as he was trying to persecute the Christians, you know the story, Jesus Christ appeared to him, spoke to him, and blinded him. Okay, until he believed on Christ, received him as his saviour, and then God used him as his apostle. And look, at, look at verse number 9, again, the humility of, of Paul. He says, For I am the least 
of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So why isn't he meet or suitable to be an apostle in his opinion? Because he wasn't there for, the, for those three years of ministry? No, because he persecuted the church. Okay? He hated the church. He saw the church as a cult. If Paul was here today, before his salvation, he would try to persecute us. He would try to throw us into prison. Okay? And please, you know, enjoy the benefits and the blessings we have as a nation, that we can meet freely, that we can meet without uh, persecution, that we can go knock doors and preach the gospel. I mean, sometimes we say, oh, we're being persecuted because someone uh, swears at us. That's not persecution. I mean, unless you're getting thrown in jail or you're getting head beheaded. Yeah, okay, now, you, now you're suffering persecution. But, you know, just people just swearing at you and telling you to get lost. I mean, that's not just, you know, we, we've got to, you know, we, we can't be so easily offended as believers, okay? That, that is not persecution. You know, we need to take advantage. You know, if we're not using the liberty that we have today to preach the gospel, when persecution does come, guess what? You're, not, you're going to do it even less. Okay, so, so use your time now. Not, now's the time to earn your rewards in heaven. But verse number 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. So he's, he's an apostle. By the grace of God, by his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. So he says, look, I'm the least of the apostles, but I've worked harder than all of them. Okay? Now, are you saying, well, is he, he's being boastful there, isn't he? He's being very proud. But then he says this, Yet not I but the grace of God which was given with me. So whatever success and whatever work you do for the Lord, you know, don't boast about it. Yeah, you might work more than others, okay? And Paul, we know he did not have a family. We know he wasn't married. He didn't have kids. The other apostles did. Of course, he's going to have more time to serve the Lord. He's going to have more time to labor more abundantly than the others. But still he says, but you know, it's the grace of God. Because I was persecuting the church, Whatever success I do now is because of the grace that God bestowed upon me, which is obviously salvation through Jesus Christ and the working of him uh, uh, through, through his life. Verse number 11, and I, I like what he says in verse 11. So even though he's labored more, even though the, the reason this church exists is because of his labors of preaching the gospel, he says, therefore, in verse 11, therefore, whether it were I or they, like the other apostles, so we preach and so ye believed. Okay, so it doesn't matter who it was that preached it. The fact is you received the gospel and you believed. That's the main thing, okay? So it's just something we all need to do. You know, if you say, I labor abundantly, and you say, well, I don't labor all that much, it doesn't matter. Your job is to preach the gospel. Use the labor that God's given you, give the, the ministry of reconciliation to make sure the gospel is preached, okay? Now, verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... So that's what we preach. That's the gospel, right? We preach that he died for your sins, was buried, and that he rose again. And by the way, one thing that I did want to mention, uh, just look back at the, the gospel there in verse number, sorry, uh, verse, chapter 15, verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Please, please notice that, you know, the third day is mentioned there. So when you preach the gospel, make sure people understand that Christ was resurrected three days later. Okay, I once had a question come my way saying, you know, does someone have to believe that Christ was resurrected three days later in order to be saved? Now, I, I, don't, I don't think someone has to believe that, okay? But my question back to that is, well, why would you skip it? I mean, you're already telling them that Christ was resurrected from the dead. Why can't you just say he was resurrected from the dead three days later? I mean, why is that such a hard thing to throw out, right? It probably took me less than a second to say that, three days later. But we see that Paul emphasizes the three days, so we ought to emphasize the three days. You say, why is that? It's because, remember, what was the sign that was given to the unbelieving Jews? It was a sign of Jonas that he was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. And so, if someone understands the three days, they understand that this is a... Well, if they, they learn about the Bible, they understand that there's this prophecy. But they also understand, hey, yes, there was a fixed time. Three days later, he rose from the dead. This isn't some thing that happened a hundred years later. This isn't... You know, it reinforces the fact that it was a physical resurrection. And those that saw him put to death also then saw him raised from the dead, which is why they were able to serve God and give their life for, for the gospel, okay? So please, you know, it's easy. Just, just throw it in there, three days. Make sure they understand. Um, I'm finding people, you know, just in the years that I've gone soul winning, the first few years, people knew. I'd ask them, how long was, I'd ask them, how long was Jesus buried for? Oh, three days. Today, it's, it's sort of like less and less people know. I don't, I don't know how long he was buried for. So it's, it's something that's being dropped, I guess, from from, I don't know, uh, presentations or movies or whatever people do to hear about the gospel. Um, so yeah, make sure you reinforce that fact that he was 
He was uh, raised from the dead three days later. Uh, verse number 12. So it, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, I used to think this was saying that people were denying that Christ resurrected from the dead. Though that's, that's not what's being said. What's being said here is that, not that, not that, because they, they know that Christ rose from the dead. That was, that, that's what was preached to them. The gospel was preached to them. But that they were saying among themselves there's no resurrection of the dead meaning for, like, for themselves. Okay, now let me give you an example of this. At four years old, I believed the gospel. I understood it. Jesus died for my sins, rose again from the dead, believe on him, not of works. I understood that. But I had this idea that, you know, heaven was this spiritual, intangible thing. You know, you go to heaven, you know, I want to avoid hell. You know, you want to avoid hell and, and be sure you go into heaven. But it wasn't until I heard preaching in my local church on the end times, you know, it, it was a pre-trip rapture position back then, but it doesn't matter. Still taught some, some key things there that there was going to be a resurrection of bodies, that there was going to be, God's going to give us a physical body, that there was going to be a tribulation period, that there was going to be a millennium, that there was going to be new heavens and new earth. And for me, all that stuff was groundbreaking. I, I never heard, I never knew. I thought this word was just going on indefinitely. Just, in, just forever this world just continue. People would either believe Christ or reject Christ. I never thought there'd be an end to it all until I heard that preaching. So at that point, if you asked me as a child, you know, do you believe in, the, in that we're going to be raised, like physically raised from the dead, I probably would have said, no, I don't. you know, we're going to heaven, kind of like spiritual thing, right? So I kind of think that's probably something similar to what was going on here. They hadn't fully understood, yes, they knew that Christ rose from the dead, but they hadn't fully understood that they would rise from the dead. And the reason I say that is because the rest of the chapter is about how we're go going to physically rise from the dead. Okay, so Paul is just reinforcing to them, hey, this is, all of us are going to be resurrected from the dead. But notice what it says here, um, uh, verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. So see how Paul kind of separates those two? So if there's no resurrection of the dead, like for the believers, then by implication, what you're saying, without realizing what you're saying, is that you're saying that Christ was not risen. Okay? Why? Because those two things go together. The reason why we're, we're, we're sure of a, of a physical resurrection is because we're sure of the resurrection of Christ. The reason why we're going, the power of the resurrection that we're going to be raised from and have our bodies changed over is the power of the resurrection of Christ. It is through Christ that we too can partake of that resurrection. Okay? So if you deny the resurrection of believers, then by implication, you're kind of saying, well, he wasn't risen from the dead either, okay? Those two things go ahead. You can't separate one from the other. You can't separate one from the other, okay? Uh, now, verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, I'm going to speed through some of these verses here. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, sorry, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So he keeps talking about how important the resurrection is because if there's no resurrection, this is just a waste of time. This is, this, you know, what's the point of being in church? What's the point of hearing preaching? It's all vain, it's all empty. Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Now, isn't it funny that the Jehovah Witnesses who deny the resurrection, they call themselves, you know, Jehovah Witnesses. And what do we call them? False witnesses. <laughs> Jehovah false witnesses. And that's what Paul's calling them. Because they deny the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. <laughs> they deny the physical resurrection of Christ that means they're false witnesses of God, and that's exactly what they are. Okay, so we have Paul preaching against the Jehovah's Witnesses already here before they even started. Because we have testified of God that he have raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. Verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Jehovah Witnesses, you're yet in your sins because they don't believe the resurrection of Christ. Okay, well, they believe in works anyway. So, I mean, even if, they, even if they change their view on the physical resurrection, they're still thinking that they've got to live a good life and keep the commandments to be saved. So anyway, they are yet in their sins, okay? Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I mean, that, that's true. I mean, if, if this is all a, a, a lie, the story of Jesus is a lie, he was never resurrected from the dead, then we, as far as the world is concerned, are the most miserable people. 
Because we're, we're, we're gathering together over, over lies and, and false, false things. You see, it's, 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 we, should just be, we should just be doing something else with our lives, basically, if none of this was true. Okay? Verse, uh, what am I up to, guys? Verse 20? Yeah, it's verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. So it reinforces, yes, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man, who's this man? That's talking about Adam, okay? For since by man came death. There was no death before Adam and Eve. And when they partook of that fruit, they brought death into the world, okay? So for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Which man came and brought the resurrection of the dead? Well, we just saw in verse 20, okay? It was Christ. Christ become the first fruits of them that slept. So by man, Adam, he brought death, and by another man, Jesus Christ, he brings that resurrection of the dead, everlasting life, eternal life, okay? Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay? So if you want to have spiritual life, everlasting life, you can't just be born of Adam, okay? because if you're born of Adam, you're going to all die, this physical, every, your physical body, even if you make the rapture, is going to die, okay? It's going to die, but so in Christ shall all be made alive, okay? This is talking about the resurrection of believers, okay? Now, we're going to skip verses 23 to 28 for now, okay? And if I have enough time, we're going to go back to it. Uh, otherwise, we'll probably save this for Thursday. But let's turn to verse 29, 29, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, this is a bit of a challenging verse. Now, the, the, the cults, we already saw the Jehovah Witnesses, how they mess things up. The Mormons, the, the other cult, the Mormons take this verse and says, look, yeah, the Bible says we can be baptized for the dead. Do you guys know about that? Yeah? The Mormons teach this. You can be, so if, you're, if your relative was a non-believing Mormon or was never baptized, then basically me, because I've got their DNA, can be baptized on their behalf so they can hopefully make it to heaven or whatever. I, I don't know. So whatever, whatever it is they teach. Okay? And isn't it funny how you take a verse that's kind of vague like this and the cults just run to it. Instead of just going to the clear passages, we know that bap what is baptism? It's, it's for a believer, and it's just you identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Right? I mean, we have many clear verses about that, right? But they'll take a vague verse like this and say, well, hey, this is saying you, need to be, you can be baptized for the dead. What did we just read about? People that are denying or not understanding that there's a physical resurrection. Okay? So this is addressing those people. Okay? Now, again, what is, what is baptism? Water baptism, you're identifying with the death, because it's the gospel, you're identifying with the gospel. The death on the cross, the burial on the water, and when you take him out of the water, the resurrection, right? The new life that Christ re received, the new life that we ought to walk in, we take them out of the water, right? Now that's important, if I'm going to baptize you, that we believe in the resurrection, right? Otherwise, I'm just going to hold you on the water, right? <laughs> you know, the, the death, the burial, well, there's no resurrection, I'll just hold you there. <laughs> You know, that is what's going on here, okay? Because he's saying, look, if you, when you were baptized, you were baptized with the death, burial, and resurrection, that picture. But then, you know, because you, you've, you've not understood it, and by the way, let me, let's look at this verse here. Uh, at the beginning of it, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Now, you know that for can also mean because of, right? Because of the dead. So it's kind of like saying, um, you know, someone that's wanted for murder, you know, you're not, you're not wanting that person so they can commit murder. You're wanting them because they've committed murder, right? You want to uh, arrest them, throw them in prison, or whatever that is, okay? It's the same kind of idea that uh, what else shall they do which are baptized for the dead? So if, if you're kind of denying the resurrection, then your baptism was just a baptism of death, okay? It was just a baptism of death. Why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, they weren't baptized for the dead, okay? They weren't. We saw, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that baptisms were done... Uh, in the name of Christ, you know, and picturing his death, burial, and resurrection. So the fact that you were just, you were baptized, how can you then deny the resurrection, is what he's saying, okay? Because if you deny the resurrection, then you're just saying you've been baptized for the dead because of, because of the death, but you're not being baptized 
picturing the resurrection. Okay? So he's just tying all that in. If I haven't explained that well, please, please let me know. Verse 30. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? So there's, there's a peril or jeopardy, the peril of death without the hope of, resur of the resurrection. Okay? Verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. Okay? So there is a death that we talk about as believers. There is a death, of, there is a true death, and that is the death of this body. It is the death of this flesh. Okay? Now Paul is saying, look, I die daily. I don't need to wait for the resurrection for, or, my, or my physical death for me to die in the flesh. Okay? He's basically teaching here about the old man and the new man, the flesh and the spirit. And we as believers, we ought to die daily as well, okay? Because every morning, you every morning you wake up, that old man, that flesh, that sinful nature that, that is in Adam, okay, is always there. It's always present. It always wants to sin. It always wants to disobey God. It always wants to please just the man, okay? But that part of you, Paul says, that's what I, I kill every day. I die daily, okay? Why? So he can then walk in the Spirit. He cannot walk after the flesh, but walk in the Spirit and, and put off that old man, put on the new. This is something, this is a reality of our life. Every day we need to be mindful that I need to put off that old man, I need to die daily and walk according to the Lord. Verse 32. If after the manner of man I have fought with beasts at Ephesus... Now, I don't, I don't get this part of the chapter. If you guys know, let me know. But it seems to be saying he, he, he fought with animals at Ephesus. Now, I don't know if he's talking about literal wild animals. You know how Paul was bitten by a snake at some point? I, I don't know if that's kind of, he's had other battles with animals. Or if he's talking about beasts like, you know, false prophets or something like that. Or something. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but then he says, What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So what advantage is there if there's no resurrection? You know, instead of, instead of being miserable, miserable people, you know, coming and hearing preaching about a lie, we should just be out there, you know, enjoying life, eating, drinking, being merry, right? Just, just, the, just live for the pleasures of this world. And that's what a lot of people are in this world. They don't believe in a heaven. They believe they're just going to be buried six feet under. So you know what? Their life is all about now. They don't think about the eternal things. They don't think about where they're going to be. They don't, they don't even have fear that their soul might be in hell. And they just live it up now. And they live for themselves. Instead of dying daily, which is what we ought to do as believers, they just live it up. And if there's no resurrection, hey, we should just be living it up as well. Because this is the only life we have to live. But that's not true, right? That's not true. But look at verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So, you know, if we live it up, we eat, drink, and be merry... You know, it's basically saying that, you know, evil communications, it's kind of saying this, bad company or bad friends ruins your character, okay? If we're living it up, well, you're going to have the bad company around you and it's going to hurt your manners. It's going to corrupt your Christian testimony. So you need to be mindful of the kind of friends that you do have, okay? Be thoughtful about, hey, you've got a church of people you know, of all different ages, all kind of backgrounds, we ought to make friends of the people in our church to make sure, hey, that we, we, we encourage one another and, you know, we don't go out there and just live for this world alone, okay? Verse 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. So the question came to Paul, kind of like mockingly, hey, what's this resurrection? What body is that? And Paul calls them fools. Like, don't you know that that which thou, which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die? In order for us to receive our resurrected bodies, this body, this flesh and blood right now, needs to die. Okay? Now, it talks about there, like that which, which thou sowest. It's kind of like a seed... You take a seed and you plant it. You sow it into the ground, okay? And for that seed to become a tree, the seed needs to die, okay? Now that seed dies and out of that, you have the, the tree or the plant that grows out of it, okay? But notice that it's the same elements, okay? The tree develops through that seed, okay? And so when Christ resurrects our bodies, he takes 
some of those old elements that make us up and, and, and once it dies, he takes it and creates a brand new resurrected body from whatever left, remains are left of your body, okay? So it's, 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 it's a new body, but it's somehow the same body, okay? You're still going to be able to know, oh, that's Kevin, that's Callan, you know, that's Cameron, right? Kind of like when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, you know, he was able to show them the nail prints in his hands and, 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 and the, 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 um, the wound on his side. He still had that same resurrected body, okay? But for us, we're not going to have the defects that we have today. We're not going to have the chronic illnesses that we have today. We're going to be given brand new bodies. And I believe the reason why Jesus Christ still had those, those uh, nail prints in his hands and things like that is just so for all eternity we can remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. Okay, so we never forget, even in eternity, even 10,000 years from today, we'll still see Jesus Christ and remember the sacrifice, the awesome sacrifice that he did for us, okay? Now, verse 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now, it's saying here that everybody gets their own body, okay? Now, now we'll, we'll just read through this just quickly. Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh. Now, this is a good verse for the, you know, evolutionists, okay? Because what does evolution teach? That all of us, animals, humans, trees, we all came from the same, you know, uh, single cell organism that creeped out of, uh, out, of, out of water at some billions, trillions years ago, whatever it is, right? It's, we're all kind of the same thing. Paul says, no, that's not true. We're not the same flesh. Verse 39, uh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts. So are, are animals and beasts the same as men? No, we're, we're different flesh. Another of fishes and another of birds. So birds don't have the same flesh as, anim, as beasts, or fishes don't have the same flesh as, anim, as, um, as birds. And, you know, so we're not animals, okay? God has given us our own bodies. And then he says this, verse 40, there are celestial bodies, and I believe that's talking about the heavenly, you know, the, the sun, moon, and stars. We'll see that soon. And bodies terrestrial, things that are on this earth. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Verse 30, 30, 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. It's, it's a different object, okay? And another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Okay, so where's Paris? Paris, remember you asked me the question, we, we, I, was, I was preaching on uh, creation and the age of the earth, and you asked me, why do I believe the sun is different to the stars? Because you know, science teaches that our sun is just a star. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing special. You know, it's just, just one star of the trillions of stars that are in the universe. Well, this verse tells us that there's a glory, verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. You see how God separates the sun from the stars, okay? So yeah, maybe it's made of some similar, you know, chemical composition, but yet for God, the sun is something special, you know, which is why our world is special. The, this earth is special. There's not like other earths out there with, with populations and aliens out there, you know, flying on their UFOs, coming to visit the earth or anything like that. No, you know, the sun is something that's unique and special that God created for this earth. He doesn't liken it to the rest of the stars. He says it's got its own body. Okay, it's got its own glory. Okay, verse 42. So also, so in the same way, there are all these bodies, animals, different bodies for animals, the celestial bodies and different to the terrestrial bodies. In the same way, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So these bodies we have now, God says they're corruptible. They're, it's a sinful nature. Okay, you don't want to go to heaven in this flesh, okay? You're not going to be able to experience heaven in this flesh. But that's why it's sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. So God's going to change his corrupted body for an incorrupted body, a body that's never sinned, okay? Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. So this body is dishonorable, okay? This body's weak. This body's going to die. This body gets diseases, okay? It gets sick. It is raised in glory, Okay? It's a glorious body. The new body God's going to promise us is a glorious body. It is sown in weakness. This is a weak body. It is raised in power. God's going to give us a powerful body. 
okay? And this, you know, for, for you that, that suffer from illnesses and chronic diseases and things like that, this ought to be your hope, okay? This life is a vapor. It's here one day, it's gone the next. But you have all eternity to rejoice in these new bodies that God has promised us, okay? New bodies forever and ever. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So by natural there, it's like an earthly body, right? And, and raised a spiritual body or a heavenly body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay, so it's a new body. God, it is, it is a brand new body that God promises us, okay? And verse 45, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, and the last Adam, that's talking about Jesus Christ, the last Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Because when you, when you believe on Jesus Christ, you're born of the spirit. Your spirit's been quickened. It's been made alive. Okay? Then just notice there in verse uh, 44 and 45, we then have, we have the trinity of man there again. Right? Because verse 44 is talking about the flesh. Then, you know, when we're, when we're born of Adam, we're, we're given that living soul. We have the soul. And then when we believe on Christ, our, our spirit is revived, made alive. There's a the spirit. You know, the body, soul, and spirit of man. Okay? So man is, is a trinity, just like God is a trinity. Okay? Verse 46. How be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So we first received our natural bodies when you're born from your mother, but then afterward we're going to be given these spiritual bodies. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthly, such are also they... Sorry, that... Sorry, uh, uh, I'll read that again. Verse 48. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. So we're going to have these heavenly bodies. Verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This flesh and blood will never experience the kingdom of God that we have. It cannot inherit. Why? Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Because heaven, you know, the new heavens and the new earth is incorruptible. There's no sin. And if we enter into heaven with this corrupted body, we're going to defile the place, okay? So we can't have something that's corruptible enter into something that's incorruptible. Otherwise, you turn the incorruptible corruptible. Okay, so we, that's why we need these new resurrected bodies. Now, just notice that it said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God because we are flesh and blood today. But I'll just read to you Luke 24, verse 39, just very quickly. When Jesus came and showed himself to the apostles and to, um, to Thomas, he says this, Behold my hands and my feet, that it, that it is I myself. Handle me. So it's a physical, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So Christ's resurrected body was what? Flesh and bone. But what's not going to inherit the kingdom of God? Flesh and blood. Somehow this new resurrected body, it's still flesh, there's still bone, but there's no blood. Okay? I, I don't fully understand that. But flesh and blood, what we have today, will not inherit the kingdom, but the new body will be flesh and bone. Okay? That's why we can inherit the kingdom of God. It's a different body. Verse 51. Verse 51. All right, yeah. Behold, I show you a mystery. So now we're getting onto the rapture. We're getting onto the resurrection of the saints. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We will all be changed. Okay? Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So the dead will be raised to incorruption, but then it says those that remain, and we shall be changed. So even those that are alive and remain on this earth will be changed. And if we're going to be changed to these incorruptible bodies, that means that old, that old corruptible body must die as well, okay? So when God makes that change, your old body dies, but your new body is given to you, okay? You're changed. Now, those that believe in a pre-trib rapture, okay, our fellow brethren that I love very much, that believe in a pre-trib rapture, they'll often take verse 52 all by itself. Now notice how verse 51 ended with a comma. Has the sentence finished after verse 51? No. Is verse 52 a brand new sentence? 
No, it continues on from verse 51. But the way they read verse 52, because they believe in this secret rapture, they believe that nobody's going to see it, it's no, there's no warnings, it's quiet, it's secret, and if they've seen the Left Behind movies, all people will see is, is a bunch of clothes left behind. Okay? Like, that's all they'll see. Like, maybe your wedding ring or whatever else that's not part of your natural body, that's all going to be left behind, and then that's when people know, oh, look, you know, millions of people have disappeared throughout the world or whatever. That's where they take this from, because they say it hap the, the rapture, they say, it happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, which is faster than a second. And they say, see, it's just this quick thing that disappears, nobody knows about it, it's a secret. But is that what is being taught here? Is what being, is being taught is that the whole rapture, the cr Christ coming back in the clouds, you know, raising, the graves being opened and the, and the dead being raised, you know, the angels coming and gathering the elect, the sound of the trumpet, you guys know about the rapture, the voice of the shout of the archangel, all of that, is, this, is it saying that all of that happens in the twinkling of an eye? No, because we read verse 51 again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So the change in our bodies is what happens in the twinkling of an eye. It's immediate, it's, it's quick, it's sudden. All of a sudden your body will be changed. It's not saying the whole rapture happens in the twinkling of an eye. Okay? If we keep it the context, the context is very clear. What happens in the twinkling of an eye is the change in our bodies. Okay? Now notice, because there's another group of believers that also believe, you know, in, in the rapture, and they'll take verse 52. And for some reason, verse 52 is just so confusing for some people. But they'll take verse 52, it says here, in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, if you know the book of Revelation, you know the wrath of God, there's the seven trumpets and there's the seven vials, okay? And some people will teach, well, see, it's the seventh trumpet that the, the rapture takes place in. Not when the sun and moon are darkened. They'll say when the seventh trumpet, the last trump, they'll say. That's what it means. First of all, the problem there is the book of Revelation was written much later than the book of 1 Corinthians. So when Paul is telling the Corinthians at the last trump, if, if he's to assume they know about the... Like, obviously, they don't know about the seventh trumpet. It's not been written yet, okay? I mean, you, you, you would think if it said here, at the seventh trumpet, or something like that, you think, okay, maybe that ties into the wrath of God being poured out, okay? But the next thing you need to understand is, yes, trump by itself can mean one trumpet. It can mean that, but it also means the sound of a trumpet, Okay, so uh, you take a trumpet and you, and you blow, blah, 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 blah. that sound is a trump. Okay, and this verse explains that to be true. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound? No, for the trumpet shall sound. What's the sound that the trumpet makes? The trump. Okay, so it's at the last trump of the trumpet, meaning... That one trumpet can make multiple trumps, right? So it's at the last trump, the, the last blast of that trumpet, that we're raised incorruptible, okay? Meaning that there must be, if it's the last trump, it must mean that there must be, have been previous trumps before that. Does that make sense? Of that one trumpet. Now, please keep a finger there in 1 Corinthians 15. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So this is the most famous chapter on the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. It says this, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. You see that? So when Christ comes in the clouds, bum, ba -da bum trump sound, right? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then when, so when Christ comes, bum, ba -dum, bum, and then when we're given our resurrected bodies, bum, ba -dum, bum, there's at least two trumps that come from that trumpet. Does that make sense? There's at least two trumps. So when we read the last trump back in 1 Corinthians 15, it's not the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation, but it's the last sound that trumpet makes. So there's, there's, a, there's at least two. Maybe there's more. Who knows? But at least in Scripture, we can definitely determine there's two blasts of that trump when Christ descends and when we're given those resurrected bodies. Okay? Back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And what time is it? 
Do you guys want me to preach the whole thing? Just get this chapter out of the way. No one's in a rush? Let's just let's preach the whole thing. Let's go back to verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. This, the, the, the passages that we skipped. Now, it's going to be an in-depth Bible study, okay? So I need you guys to pay attention, okay? I need to pay attention to make sure I preach this right. There's a lot that we need to look at here. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. So everybody that gets resurrected from the dead, there's an order to that, okay? Everyone in their own order. Christ, the first fruits. So who's the first to be have been resurrected from the dead? Jesus Christ. Okay? He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Why? Because in the same power of Christ that was resurrected, that same power is, that, is, is of our resurrection of Christ. We're resurrected because we're in Christ. Now, some people teach some, some crazy things. They say, well, you know, there's five raptures. There's seven raptures that you can find in the Bible. Any, anyone think of what the first rapture could be that they think about? Enoch. Enoch. They think of Enoch. I say, see, Enoch is a picture of the rapture. He was raptured first before anybody else. No. Christ is the first fruits. Now, Enoch was taken up to, into heaven. Elijah was taken up into heaven. But they, weren't, they didn't receive their resurrected bodies. Okay? This is the order of the resurrected bodies. Okay? And so when we talk about the rapture, we're not saying just going to heaven. Because anyone that dies goes to heaven. Does that mean we're all being raptured when we die? No. Okay? Otherwise, we've got millions of raptures happening throughout the Bible, right? The rapture or the resurrection is a physical resurrection. And so Enoch, you know, who else? Maybe you might think of Moses or Elijah. These guys do not have a physical body just yet. Okay? And some people say, well, what about all these people that Christ raised from the dead? You know, Lazarus and um, there was that little girl, that little girl that he raised from the dead or some of the Old Testament prophets raised people from the dead. You know, what about these people? Well, when they were raised from the dead, again, they didn't receive their new, resurrected, incorruptible bodies. They just, re they just got the back their old corrupted bodies back again, and they were raised from the dead. It wasn't the resurrection that we know about, okay? So no resurrection of the physical, incorruptible body has taken place until Christ first was raised from the dead. Here's the first. Here's the first fruits, okay? This is the order. Christ the first fruits. Um... Sorry, I've lost my place a little bit here. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Christ the first, first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. That's us. We're Christ's. Afterward, when at his coming, we'll receive our resurrected bodies, right? That's the order of resurrection. Christ first, then us at his coming. Verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father when he have put down all rule and authority and power. So there is actually a th another resurrection that takes place at this time, at the end, when, he, when all things are put under Jesus Christ. We'll go there soon. Don't, don't turn away yet. Verse 25, For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. So we know about Christ's millennium king, millennial kingdom. The whole purpose of that is to put all his enemies under his feet. Everything would be subjected under Christ during that time. Verse 26, And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay? That's the last enemy at the end. Death. Verse 27, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is ex accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued un unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So once everything is subjected under Christ, then Christ subjects himself under, to the Father. Once everything's been put under Christ, he's under the authority of the Father, and that's when the new heavens and the new earth are created. That's at the end of the millennium. Okay. Now, look at verse 54, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Because this part is important. So when this corruptible... So don't forget what we've just read. I'm going to cover that soon. I just want to keep that fresh in your mind. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, that means we can never die, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Do you see that? So when we have put on our new bodies, our incorruptible, glorious, powerful bodies at the resurrection, 
It shall come to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. That's the saying that was written in Isaiah. So keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 15. Turn to Isaiah 25. Isaiah 25. And I think you'll like this study, okay? Because this kind of, all this stuff blew my mind. Isaiah 25. Isaiah 25. Verse number 8. Isaiah 25, verse 8. This is the saying that will come to pass at the resurrection. Isaiah 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. So at the beginning there, he will swallow up death in victory. That was what's written in Isaiah, referring to the resurrection. Our resurrection. Okay? And then it says, And the Lord will wipe away tears from off their faces. So not only do we get our resurrected bodies, but God then takes away our tears. We'll never sorrow anymore. Okay, we'll be with Him forever. Okay, now, before we... <laughs> there's a few things I need to show you this. Okay, now the book of Isaiah, how many chapters does it have? Anyone know? 66. How many books of the Bible are there? 66. Okay, now, when I was in Canada, I was given a book called The Tuning Fork. Yes, this sermon's endorsed by The Tuning Fork. But, um... <laughs> What was good about this book is that it goes through the book of Isaiah and shows similarities between the chapters of Isaiah with the books of the Bible. Now, if you've read through your Bible cover to cover a few times, you'll probably notice this. You know, Isaiah chapter 1, you can very clearly see things about Genesis, about the creation. And if you read Isaiah chapter 66, you definitely see things about the new heaven and the earth, which the book of Revelation talks about, okay? You definitely see some similarities, but I, I didn't know how in-depth this was. I didn't, I didn't realize that probably every chapter has something about every book of the Bible. It's, it, the book of Isaiah is, is truly special. It's truly miraculous because every chapter links back to the book of its corresponding number. Okay? Now, in saying that, we just read from Isaiah 25. Does anybody top of their head know what the 25th book of the Bible is? I'll get, what I get you to do is stay in Isaiah and stay in 1 Corinthians. Turn to your table of contents at the start of your Bible, where you've got your Bible books listed in order. And please read, first one that knows the answer, put your hand up. Please tell me what the 25th book of the Bible is. The 25th book of the Bible. Put your hand up if you know the answer. Yep. Lamentations. Now, the book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. Now, what does it mean to lament? What's a, what's a lamenta what does lamentation mean? It means to cry. It means to sorrow. Yeah? Now, what's God going to do? Wipe away tears from our faces. Read about in Isaiah 25. Turn to Lamentations. If you're in Isaiah, you just go back a couple of books to Lamentations. Sorry, no, you go forward. Forward a couple of books to Lamentations, sorry. Lamentations, chapter 1. So, if you've read Lamentations, it's a really, it's a book of sorrow. Okay? It's Jeremiah weeping over Judah because it's been taken over by Babylon. And he's just weeping about the situation of his nation. He's crying over his people. He's crying about his nation. Okay? Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. Let's look at this. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow? Talking about Judah and Jerusalem. She that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces, how is she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she have none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. So we see that this, just the start of this book, Judah as a nation is weeping, right? Now turn to chapter 3, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. I think this is important to look at. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. So God's going to do good to those that wait for him. When we talk about the rapture and the resurrection, what are we instructed to do? To wait for the coming of the Lord, right? Look at verse 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Okay, this is not talking about the salvation of your soul, but when we tie this all together, it is the salvation of our flesh. 
It is that new resurrected body that we're waiting for today. And should we wait, God will reward us with that physical resurrected body, right? So we started in Lamentations with the weeping, but then we have this hope that if we wait for the Lord, He will come with His salvation. We'll rejoice and be glad in His salvation. We're not going to weep anymore, okay? And I want to just show you that, that correlation there back to Isaiah chapter 25. Lamentations is the 25th book in, in, uh, in, um, in the Bible. Yeah. Now go back to Isaiah 25. Back to Isaiah 25. We read verse number 8, didn't we? I'll read verse, 28, uh, sorry, verse number 8 again. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off their faces, from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off, from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. And look verse num number 9. And it shall be said in that day. What day are we talking about? We know that saying is about the resurrection. What will be said about that day? Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Do you see the, 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 the similarity there with the book of Lamentations? Waiting upon the Lord, rejoicing in his salvation. Spoken about here in Isaiah 25 verse 9. Referencing the time when death, when, sorry, when, uh, when death will be swallowed up in victory. The resurrection. Which is what Paul talks about. Now, this, is just, this stuff is amazing to me, right? Because Isaiah lived about 100 years before Jeremiah. Imagine me writing stuff today, and then 100 years later, someone else writing about the same kind of thing. And then Paul, you know, thousands of years later, coming and writing about something to do with that, okay? Now, <laughs> that's not the end of it. Please turn to Revelation now. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I mean, this should make you think about the book of Isaiah a little bit and go, whoa, <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> well, it's not weird, it's miraculous, okay? It's amazing, it is amazing. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. Now, if you know about the rapture, I won't go through it all, but Revelation chapter 6 talks about the sun and moon being darkened, okay? And Matthew 24 talks about when the sun and moon are darkened, that's when Christ comes in the clouds and will be gathered, the elect will be gathered by the angels. You know, the, the rapture takes place at that point in time. But then in Revelation chapter 7, we have this multitude, this great multitude that appears in heaven. And I, I say that's us. That's us. Look at verse 13. We won't read the whole thing. Let's just look at verse 13 to 17. And one of the elders answered, this great multitude of every tongue of every nation comes to heaven, raptured after the sun and moon are darkened. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Where do they come from? Verse 14, and I said unto him, John says unto him, Sir, thou knowest. So you know, you know where they've come from. I don't know. You know where they come from. And he said unto me, these are, they, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, Neither shall, the sun light on, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living waters, fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So we have John writing Revelation, lining up with Paul who wrote 1 Corinthians, lining up with Isaiah and Jeremiah. When does this take place? After the tribulation, after the sun and the moon are darkened, we have this multitude in heaven, they've got their resurrected bodies, death is swallowed up in victory, they will no longer have tears in their eyes because God himself will come and wipe those tears off our faces, off our cheeks. Okay? It, the Bible's amazing. The Bible's truly amazing. Now, remember the order. Okay? The order was Christ of fruit, first fruits, they that come uh, at his coming, that's us, that's what we just read about, but then cometh the end when all things are subdued under on on Christ, at the end of the millennium. So you're, you're in Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Because think about this, after we're given our resurrected bodies, there's still people on this earth that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Okay? There's still a good thousand years and there's still that time period of God's wrath being poured out. I don't know if people are getting saved during that period or not. Uh, maybe. I don't have a reason not to believe, like, to, to believe that. You know, possibly the 144,000 um, Israelites of every, from every 12 tribes seem to be going out and being witnesses to Christ. So I would say there are people getting saved. But still, that there's, a bit, there's a long period of time after that, re- that rapture, after that resurrection, that people are living. And they're living in their natural, corrupted, sinful bodies. Okay? So they, you know, those that believe in Christ, they need their own resurrection as well. They need to receive that incorruptible body. Look at chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. When were these people beheaded? Re- read about that in Revelation chapter 5. They were beheaded by the Antichrist. They were beheaded by the beast for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, These people... And for the word of God, uh, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these people, they're beheaded, meaning what? They've got their resurrected bodies, right? They live with Christ for a thousand years. This is the order. First Christ, then that at his coming. So when did Christ's coming happen if these people have their resurrected bodies? It happened after the tribulation. It happened after the Antichrist went persecuting the saints, right? Otherwise, how can they reign with Christ a thousand years? Okay, so we're part of this group of believers that will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. But look at verse number five. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So those that have believed on Christ, they need to live again. But they don't live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You see that in verse number five? The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Meaning that when the thousand years are finished, those dead will, be, will live again. Those that came after that first resurrection, they will live again at, at the end of the thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Verse number six, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death... The second death is the lake of fire, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So those that are resurrected with Christ and live with him for a thousand years have gone through what, what the Bible calls the first resurrection. Okay? Now there's two ways to understand this. My current understanding is that even those that were raised at the end of the thousand years experienced the first resurrection. Okay? The other understanding is, well, no, those that were raised at the end of the thousand years are going through the second resurrection. Because if there's a first, there must be a second. Now, there's two ways to think about this. Because Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, and we talk about the first resurrection, which is in the power of Christ's resurrection, it would make sense to call our resurrection the first resurrection because because we're being raised through the power of Christ, the first fruits. Okay? So in this way of thinking, you think of the first resurrection as a type of resurrection. As a type of resurrection. Meaning that if people are resurrected at different points, they're still experiencing the first resurrection because it's the first resurrection in type. That's how, that's how I currently understand that. The other view is, well, no, the rapture, that's the first resurrection, meaning at the end of the millennium, we, then, we need to call that the second resurrection. So instead of it being a resurrection of type, it's a resurrection of order, like a, a numerical order. First, then second. That's another way to view it. Now, at the end of the day, it's just semantics. What's important is this. Christ is the first fruits. There's a resurrection at his coming, at the rapture. Then there's another resurrection for believers at the end of the millennium. That's the order that's in the Bible. There's three resurrections. There's three raptures, if you will. Christ's, those that come at his coming when he comes in the clouds, and at the end of the millennium. Okay? And... So we see that, and what was important about that is that, uh, look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. We know know that um, when Christ reigns, that all the enemies must be subdued under him. And what was the last enemy that had to be subdued under Christ? Death. Look at Revelation 20, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So now death is destroyed in the lake of fire. The power of death, somehow, whatever that means spiritually, 
is thrown into the lake of fire and it's done away with. Now look at Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So this is at the end of the millennium. We have those that were resurrected. That's us. We're already resurrected. Our tears are already wiped away. But we know there's another resurrection at the end, right? Which is what we read about. At the end of the thousand years. Death is, is subdued, in, thrown into the lake of fire. And so we know there's a next, another, generation, uh, another resurrection for those that lived through that event. And then look at verse 24. Uh, sorry, verse number 4. Revelation 21, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Do you see how in the book of Revelation, there's two events where God wipes away the tears off people's faces. So the first one was at the rapture, it is coming, chapter 7, that's for us. But then those that were saved after the rapture, they also get their resurrected body, they also get their tears wiped away with. Because that's, that's the next resurrection that took place, okay? So we see the consistency in the Bible, okay? All the way back to Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Corinthians, and uh, Revelation. Back to 1 Corinthians 15. Again, if you guys have any questions about that, please ask me. Um, I'm, I'm doing my best to explain that. I was, I was trying to wrap my head around as I was preparing this. How do I explain all this? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? So the power or the pain of death, where is it when we're resurrected? It's not there anymore, right? There will be no more death. Oh grave, where is thy victory? The grave will no longer have victory because those that have died that are in graves today, those graves will be opened. They're going to rise and have their resurrected body. The grave will no longer have any power over those dead bodies. And by the way, that comes from Hosea. I'll just read it quickly. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. So even Hosea throws his ten cents in to this resurrection, okay? And then verse 56. Verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. So we'll never experience the sting of everlasting death. You know, every day that goes by, we're closer to receiving those resurrected bodies, Okay? Because, see, the law of God, the law of God will not have any strength over us anymore either when we have those new resurrected bodies. The reason why the, we're under the law, in a sense, like we need to keep the laws of God, the moral laws of God, otherwise God will chastise us even as believers, is because we do have these corrupted flesh. Because the, these, this flesh has the ability to sin against God, has the ability to, to, to break the laws of God. But when we're given those new resurrected bodies, they will be perfect, they will be sinless, we'll never have a temptation to sin again. And that's why there'll be, the, the law of God will not have any power over us. Okay? And that's why when you're saved, the new man, you know, you're not under the law anymore because the new man is unable to sin. That new spirit, that new man that Christ has put into us. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Christ is our victory. We're victorious because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 58, Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast. So at the end of all this, there's a resurrection. God's promised us these immortal, perfect bodies that we'll be able to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years. We'll be with Him for all eternity. We'll be with Christ forever. We'll never sin again, right? And He says, therefore, because I've taught you all this, now you understand all this, my brethren... Be ye steadfast. Stand firm, he's saying. Unmovable. You know, don't let false doctrine deceive you or get you unsettled. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, be in increase in the work of, go of God. You know, God's going to make you have plenty if you strive and work for Him. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Again, because if there's no resurrection, it's all in vain. It's all empty. It's all useless. But because we know of the resurrection, your labor is not in vain for the Lord. You know, this chapter ought to encourage us to serve the Lord in this earth that we have right now. It's not in vain. There's a beautiful promise of those new resurrected bodies to come. Our labor is not in vain, guys. You know, we, we go out every week preaching the gospel. We've had a lot of people saved, 
You know, but we haven't had many people come and visit from these, from these people. Do we give up? Well, that, that was vain. No, our labor's not in vain. Because those same people that we've, we, we've seen believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, those same people that have received Christ, guess where they're going to be? They're going to be at the resurrection. You know, we may never see them in this church, but we're going to see them in the clouds. If we make, well, we're all going to make the rapture, because even the dead are raised first, okay? So our labor's not in vain. The people we've seen saved, hey, they're going to thank us when they're in the clouds in their new resurrected bodies as well. Let's pray.